My name is Jasmine, and I have the honor and privilege of being here on the team at LifePoint College. Hello, Life, there they are, there's my students. Good morning. Um, and listen, I would not be doing my job right if I didn't give at least a little pitch for LifePoint College. I'll make it short. It's this, if you are thinking about it, just do it. It's the best decision, you're gonna grow, you're gonna learn, so find me afterwards, we'll connect, but if you've been thinking about it, just, just do it, it's gonna be great. So when I am not at LifePoint College and with the students, you can find me in uh, one of my favorite places in the world, and that's with my family. Um, and they have a picture, it's gonna come up on the screen. My husband, Jordan, and I, we have two beautiful miracle children. Yeah, they're really cute, you can all, aw. But before you get too deep in that all, um, can you guys show them the real picture? This is what all 30 of those pictures looked like to get to the real picture. But we have two kids. Kira is 10 months old, and she's still in the eat, sleep, make messy diapers phase. So if you can take care of that, then she's happy. She's a happy camper. Zuri, on the other hand, he is two and a half years old, y'all. He's a toddler. Okay, and right now we're in this stage where he has some very unrealistic expectations of what he's allowed to touch. So all the time, every day we hear, Zuri, touch it. Zuri, touch it. Zuri, touch it. And sometimes I can make his little dreams come true. And there's this old dump truck at the end of our street where they're doing construction. And when we go for a walk, he'll say, Zuri, touch it. And we, you know, put the stroller by and just pray he doesn't get tetanus. And he reaches his little hand out and he touches that dump truck and it literally makes his day. Um, there are other times, however, where it's, Zuri, touch it. And I'm like, no, baby, you can't touch it because it might be the person in front of us in line at the grocery store. <laughs> can't touch that, especially in the season we just came out of. Um, it might be the pilot light on our gas stove. Zuri, touch it. No, it's hot. And usually it's a jet plane that's flying 30,000 feet in the air. And he says, Zuri, touch it. Zuri, touch it. And I'm like, no, baby, we can't touch it. And I'm trying to explain physics and aviation that the plane looks like you can touch it, but it's way up there. And as you can imagine, if you have a toddler, if you had a toddler, or if you've been in like 100 yards of a toddler, maybe in the grocery store, that he has real big feelings when I say no. Like meltdown feelings, full on tears, red nose, get on the ground. And I'm just learning as a parent that it's my job when he has those big feelings, not to make them go away, his feelings aren't bad, but it's jo my job as a parent to help him identify those feelings, to process, and then be able to move forward because we can't spend our whole life in the puddle on the ground. And it just means that a lot of times I have to get down on his level and say, baby, hold my hand. I tell him, take a deep breath. We're gonna be okay, and then we try to move on. And I would say for us in this room, we aren't toddlers anymore. We got bigger, right? But that does not mean that our feelings got any smaller. We just don't see them on the outside as much. But we have big, very real feelings. And those feelings aren't bad. They're just indicators that our hearts are responding to what's going on in the world around us and that we need something bigger than ourselves to help us process and be able to move forward. And listen, if there's one thing that I want you to walk away today knowing, it's that when you have those big, real emotions and feelings, especially when you're walking through difficult seasons, um, uncertainty, anxiety, when things feel out of your control, there's one thing I want you to know, is that you can be real with Jesus. And this past year, I had a year where I got very real with Jesus. I faced some uncertainty and some difficult times for sure. Last spring, my dad was going through cancer treatment and we were in the middle of trying to figure out the right protocol and which drug was gonna be the right drug and what was gonna work and what wasn't gonna work. And then in the summer, my daughter Kira was born and while her birth was uncomplicated, a few hours after she was born, things got complicated for me. So much so that the nurse very calmly said, I'm just gonna get a few more hands in the room and she pulled the code. So the room quickly filled with doctors and nurses and my husband sat across from me with our three hour old baby as they worked on me to try to get me back to a healthy place. And as you can see, I'm here. They did their job. Yeah, praise God. And you would, if I stopped there, you would say, yeah, that was quite a lot in a year, right Jasmine? But um, the story goes on. So when she was six days old, I woke up in the middle of the night 
and I could tell something was really not right with this little baby. She was retching with sickness. She was becoming less and less responsive. And so I called a friend who's a nurse on FaceTime, and I showed it to her, and she said, you need to get to the emergency room right away. And so we did. We went to the emergency room, and we spent the entire day there, and I watched my baby get sicker and sicker and sicker. And finally, after a lot of hours, they said, we've exhausted what we can do here to diagnose and to treat your baby. You need to go to the Children's Hospital in Richmond, and you need to go by ambulance. Talk about some feelings. And so we get in the ambulance, and I see my tiny little baby on an adult-sized stretcher, and I'm totally overwhelmed, and I did something that I normally would not do. I took a picture of her, and I posted it on social media because I knew in that moment that we needed some supernatural help and we needed people to pray. And so I, I did that. I asked people to pray. And we got to the hospital in Richmond, and I guarantee you the ambulance drivers probably thought I was certifiably insane because as we are walking into the building, I said, as loud as I am talking to you, I said, Holy Spirit, you've got to show up because I have run out of everything that's in me and I can't do this alone. And praise God for no medical explanation, reason, no scientific reason. They have no idea what was wrong with my daughter and they have no idea what made her better, but she got better. We were there for one day, we were discharged the next, amen. I know what it was. I know what it was God's people prayed and he did something supernatural and he intervened on her behalf and she got better, amen. That's good, he's good. But if that's where the story stopped, that'd be great, but it's not. <laughs> yeah, guys, it was a year. So the next day, it was her one week checkup. And I take her to the pediatrician and we go through the whole appointment. And then he says the words that any parent who takes their kid to the doctor never wants to hear. He said, I'm gonna need you to call your husband on speakerphone. I have some test results I wanna go over with you about Kira. And he said, it has nothing to do with why you were in the hospital this week. It has nothing to do with that but her genetic screening at birth has come back. And it's flagged for a very serious, very significant genetic disorder. He said, you're not gonna be able to see it on the outside, but there's potentially something wrong on the inside that's going to already start wrecking havoc on her body. And he tells me, no matter where she falls on the spectrum of this disorder, it's gonna be kinda bad. I've already called VCU to talk to their bone marrow transplant team because when the results get confirmed, you're gonna to wanna to meet with them to talk about a bone marrow transplant by the time she's six months old. And in this moment, I was completely overwhelmed. I'm looking at my newborn baby, thinking how long is her life gonna be? What kind of quality of life is she going to have? If this is a disorder that's passed on genetically, does my two-year-old have it too? Are we not gonna be able to have any more children because of this? When I say I went through some really big, very real emotions in that time period, I mean it. And our doctor said, you're gonna to have to wait six weeks to get confirmation of the results because they're gonna to need to sequence her DNA. There was a lot of grief. There was a lot of grief. And I wanna take you to a passage in the Bible with some people who walked through something similar they walk through a lot of grief, and I wanna learn a little bit from the responses that they had to Jesus in that moment. And this is gonna be found in John chapter 11. And if you don't have it, that's okay. It's gonna come up on the screens. But John 11 says this. Now a man was sick, Lazarus from Bethany, the village of Mary and her sister Martha, Mary was the one who anointed the Lord with perfume and wiped his feet with her hair. And it was her brother, Lazarus, who was sick. So the sisters sent a message to him, Lord, the one you love is sick. I think it's important to note from this passage that Mary, Martha, and Lazarus, they knew Jesus. See, they were followers of Jesus. At this point in Jesus' ministry, he's been, we're coming to the end of it, coming close to the time that he's gonna be crucified. So he's been out performing miracles and proclaiming that he's the son of God. And they were followers of him at that time, but not only were they followers, they were friends. 
They had spent time together. Jesus had been in their house together. And so much so that it says, Lord, the one you love is sick. There was relationship there. And so to shorten the story a little bit, Jesus hears this, and being Jesus, he does things that are unexpected. He waits. He doesn't go right away. And the disciples are confused by this, and you just got to read the Bible. Sometimes the disciples are very much like me. Jesus was like, guys, I know what I'm doing. This is what's going to happen. Just hang on a minute. (laughs) So he waits, and it's important to note that when he arrives, it's verse 17. It says, when Jesus arrived, he found that Lazarus had already been in the tomb for four days. Lazarus died. And in this culture, he wasn't just dead. He was dead, dead. See, back in these times, when someone died, they had Jewish mysticism, and they believed that the soul hung around for three days, but after three days, the person was really dead. Also, they didn't have things like stethoscopes and all of that to hear if a heartbeat was there or to know if a person was in a coma. But when Jesus gets there, it's the fourth day. And I find it fascinating that Jesus waited until he knew everyone was going to be at the very height of their grief when he showed up. And so I want to look at Martha's response first. She's the first one to go to Jesus and listen, Bible people are real people, y'all. They have real personalities, they have real problems, and if I had to guess from some other interactions in the Bible, Martha was what we would call modern times assertive. She was a little assertive. In Jasmine terms, she was a little spicy. Okay, so Martha, her brother has died, and and this time, it wasn't just that her brother was dead, she was filled with grief over that, but also Mary and Martha lived with their brother, which meant he was also their financial source. They relied on him, so not only is she overcome with grief, she's anxious about what's gonna be happening in her future. And she hears that her friend Jesus has finally shown up, and I think um, if I can just paint the picture for you, Martha said, get my keys, I need to go talk to Jesus. And she shows up and she says, Jesus, the scripture said, she says, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. And if I can read between the lines of those words, I think maybe she wasn't just saying that. She was saying, Jesus, where were you? We were waiting. Didn't you get the message? I think she was a little bit angry. See, sometimes I get a little bit angry too. I'm like, Lord, why is this happening to me? Where are you? Where's the deliverance? And they have a a conversation that's really important. Jesus says, Martha, don't you know your brother is going to live again? And she says, yes, Lord, I know I'm your follower. We're all gonna live again in the resurrection. We're all gonna come back to life. And he says this, he says, no, I am the resurrection and the life. Anyone who believes in me is never going to die, but they're going to live forever. He points her to who he is, and he says, do you believe this? She says, yes, Lord, I I do believe this. I believe you are the Messiah. And this brings me to the first point of why we can be real with Jesus, is we can be real with Jesus because of who he really is. See, the, the, the root of her anger and her frustration wasn't that Jesus was just a friend that missed Lazarus's death. It was that he was the son of God who could do something supernatural, who could intervene on their behalf. But I want you to know in those times of frustration when you're feeling a little spicy, you can be real with Jesus. You can tell him what's really going on. And the sister Martha, um, excuse me, Mary, she's next. If Martha is spicy, Mary is tender. Okay, she's a little soft-hearted. And in her moment of grief, she can't even leave the house. She's got friends in the community. They're there around her as she's weeping over her brother's death, and Martha comes home and she says, hey, Mary, Jesus is here, and he's, he's asking for you. He's calling for you. And I want you to know, for somebody in the room right now, if you've been holding back from Jesus, he's calling for you. He's calling for you. It's not too late to go to him. And so Mary goes to him, and while her words are very similar, her sentiment is totally different. She gets to Jesus and she falls at his feet in grief and being overwhelmed with her sadness. And she says, Lord, if you had just been here, my brother would not have died. She's real with Jesus. She takes her pain to Jesus' feet. Those real emotions that stir in you, that you push away, the sadness that feels heavy, you can take it to Jesus' feet. You see, in those weeks of waiting, that we were waiting for my daughter's test results, I did a lot of that. 
There were times I was laying on the floor in my bedroom closet crying out to God. Sometimes not even with words, just with tears, pouring it out to him. And a place that I loved to go cry was the shower because I didn't need a Kleenex. (laughs) The rain would just wash my tears away and I know there was a day I was praying and I just said, Lord, I, I feel depressed. I feel hopeless. I can't imagine what life is going to hold. I need your peace. And I promise you, it was like a switch went off in my heart. In Philippians 4, 6 through 7, the Bible tells us this, that if we can get our eyes fixed on who Jesus is, if we can get our eyes fixed that he's the son of God, that he's the Messiah, that he has power, if we can go to him with thanksgiving in every season, in every circumstance, with everything that's inside of us, when we take that, he wants to exchange it for something, and it's God's peace. And let me tell you, this peace is going to surpass your human understanding. It's gonna go beyond what you're walking through. And it says this peace is gonna be alive and active. It's gonna guard your heart and it's gonna guard your mind, the thoughts that you've been thinking, the anxieties you've been feeling. He's gonna guard it. The the hopelessness in your heart, he's gonna guard it. And he did that for me. He did that for me. I did not cry a single tear for the remaining weeks. And we didn't wait six weeks, we waited eight weeks to get the results. I'm gonna tell you, Jesus showed up. He did something, because those results came back that she's perfectly fine. She's perfectly healthy. Her DNA is perfectly healthy. And that brings me to the point that you can go to God and you can be real with Jesus because Jesus really has power. He has real power from heaven. And when Mary goes to him, she falls at his feet and Jesus does something interesting that really touches my heart. It's the shortest scripture in the Bible. But Jesus is so moved by her grief and Martha's grief, and I think grief in general, because Jesus was fully God. He was God living and walking on this earth, so he knew what he was going to do next. But Jesus was also fully man. He knows us because he's been us. He's walked through every feeling you're ever going to have. He's experienced every bit of grief you're ever going to have. I think on his heart in that moment was all of our grief. And Jesus wept. He wept. He has a tenderness for what you're going through. He has a sensitivity for what you're experiencing. And next, he does what only Jesus can do. He says, tell me, where is Lazarus? Well, Lazarus is dead. He's in the tomb. And he says, take me there. And he goes there, and he says, I want you to move the stone. Now remember, Lazarus is four days dead, and Bible people are real people, and they said, Lord, he's been in there for four days. It's not going to look good when you move that stone, and it's also not going to smell good. I love Bible people, because they're real. And Jesus, in that moment, gives glory to God for what he's about to do, because he's going to be able to show off God's goodness and God's glory, and he calls into the tomb, and he says, Lazarus, come out. And with the power that was in Jesus, Lazarus comes out fully wrapped in his grave cloth. I imagine mummified, walking out fully alive. A dead man came walking out of a tomb. If y'all went to a funeral and somebody said, get up out of that grave, and somebody walked out of a coffin, that's what you would sound like. Jesus really has power. He brought a dead man to life. And right now in this moment, you're going, you know what? That sounds great, Jasmine. Your daughter got better and I'm really happy for you. Mary, Martha, and Lazarus, their story ended really great because Lazarus came back to life. But let me tell you about my life. My life is messier than that. My life, the story isn't ending and if it ended right now, it sure isn't going the way that I want it to go. What about me? Where am I? My marriage is a wreck. My kids are gone from home and I don't know when they're coming back. Somebody I love is lost And I've been praying and praying and things don't seem like they're changing. Well, if that's where my story ended last year, I'd give you that point. But it's not. Remember my dad? In November, my parents decided to come and visit because they hadn't met the new baby yet. And it was my son's second birthday. So they flew up from Georgia to come visit. And we celebrated my son's birthday. It was construction themed. He was allowed to touch everything. But while they were here, my dad got really sick really fast. We thought he had a heart attack and he had to go into the hospital for a few days. 
And while he was there, I remember one day standing at my kitchen sink doing some dishes, and I felt God speak to me, almost audibly. God still speaks. Listen for his voice. He speaks to you. And he said, I let you experience my peace in your chaos because you're going to need it for what's next. And I thought, okay, in my human mind, I go, we've been trying to find the right protocol, we've been trying to find the right drug, but maybe this means I need to reconcile that in 2021, things aren't going to go the way that I want them to go. My dad came home from the hospital. We didn't know, but a few days later, he had a stroke. And on a Friday, where we, in the morning, were on the phone talking with doctors about cancer treatment and radiation and all of that, that Friday, by the evening, we were signing papers to make a very hard decision to bring my dad home to my house. And we did that. And my mom and I had the honor of loving my dad in his last few days and doing the holy work of providing him the best love and care as he passed away. And my dad died. I believed that Jesus could heal my dad. I know he could have. I prayed for it. But he didn't. But I stand here today with this testimony to tell you that despite those circumstances, I am still filled with joy. I can still look forward to the future. There are days when I am very sad, but I'm not hopeless. There are times that I have grief, but grief does not have me. And I'm here to tell you that's because we have a good God who is on our side, that he is for you. He's not against you. There's nothing in this world, no circumstance, no circumstance outside of your control, no anxiety, no anger in your heart that can keep you out of the goodness, the palm of his hand. He's a good God that loves you. And see, I don't want you to miss the miracle. The miracle is that he has the power to change a circumstance that you're in. But don't miss the miracle that he has the power to change you in the circumstance, to give you the power and you the peace and the ability to persevere whatever it is that you are walking through. And that brings me to my final point. He does this. You can be real with Jesus because he really, really loves you. He loves you. Not just like Jesus loves the whole world. No, he loves you. And he loves you. And he loves you. See, Jesus knew Mary, Martha, and Lazarus. They sat around the campfire together. I imagine telling stories and having meals, which is my favorite to eat. And they're sitting under the night sky looking at the stars that God created next to the Creator. And just like Jesus knew and numbered those stars, he knew every hair on their head. He knew what was in their hearts. He knew what was to come and what he was going to do. And I want you to know, he knows you. Just like I sometimes have to get down on the ground with my toddler and say, I'm here. I'm with you. I'm for you. Give me your hand. I want to help you process. I want to help you move forward because I love you. When I get down on that level with him, it shows him that I love him. I want you to know right now, Jesus is doing that for you. He's doing that for you. He says, give me what's in your heart. Give me your whole heart. I can handle it because I love you. And the greatest display of God being willing to come down into our mess was when he sent Jesus for us. See, we, we live a life that's not perfect, would you agree? None of us can ever be perfect. What Jesus was, was God walking the earth. He lived a perfect life to do what we couldn't, to be the example for us to strive for, but he didn't leave us in a striving place. See, our separation from God, we call that sin, which is just an archery term. It means to miss the mark of God's perfection. 
But when Jesus came and walked the earth in a perfect life, he didn't leave us there. He went to the cross and he died to take on the penalty, the weight of our separation from God, which is death. But he didn't stop there either. See, three days later, Jesus walked out of a tomb just like Lazarus to prove that he was who he said he was, that he had the power that he said he had, and that he loves you, and that he wants you to have access to it too, so that you can have a relationship with a God who so desperately loves you. And the Bible says all you have to do is believe that in your heart and confess it with your mouth. Just say it out loud, and you will be saved from that penalty of death of eternal separation from him, but also from living a life right now that feels hopeless and helpless, that feels filled with bitterness and anger and frustration and confusion. He wants you to be fully alive right now. And I think God's moving in this room. I know God is moving in this room. That some of you say, Jesus might know me, but I don't know Jesus, but I'm ready to. And today is your day. So right now with every eye closed, and every head bowed. If you feel God speaking to you right now, this is your moment. We're gonna pray together and there's nothing special in the words that I'm going to say. There's nothing magical. It's just me helping you begin a conversation with your new friend, Jesus. And we're all gonna pray it out loud together because we don't want anyone to feel alone in this moment. But if that is you right now, would you be so bold to raise your hand so that I know who I'm praying with? You can raise your hand. I see you, I see you. God sees you, he loves you so much. So let's pray together. Jesus, I need you. I believe you died for me. I believe you rose again. I believe you're the son of God. I ask you to forgive me of all my sin. Come into my heart. Make me new, make me like you. It's in Jesus' name I pray, amen. Amen, amen, amen. Hey, we hope today's message spoke to your situation and was helpful to your life. If you haven't yet, make sure you subscribe to the channel. We're posting new content every week. And also, if you'd like to partner with us financially, you can click the link below. You know, it's thanks to the generosity of people like you that we're able to meet the needs of people all over the world. So thank you for making a difference and helping deliver this message to the people that need it most. And thanks for joining us today. We look forward to seeing you soon.